Hi, I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds, and this is the first video on the new Fairwinds site. We worked really hard to make it user-friendly and searchable, and we hope you like it. If you have any questions, please send us a comment. You'll recall Marco Kaltofen. He presented at the American Public Health Association a couple months ago, and uh, we aired his presentation. Well, today, I had a longer conversation with Mr. Kaltofen. Mr. Kaltofen runs the Boston Chemical Data Corporation, and he's a professional engineer. And he talks about radiation in the environment, and especially radiation from the Fukushima accident. I hope you enjoy the conversation between Mr. Kaltofen and me. Yeah, the, the one on the right is the, most, is the fascinating one. Right, well, and these are the isotopes that that I picked up in the soil. Oh yeah, exactly in Tokyo. Same. I mean, so exactly the isotopes the you're finding in indoor air filters are exactly what I'm picking up in the soil. That's why the right. soil samples you sent are completely non-controversial, because what's in them is exactly the same as what's in every other sample we've gotten from the same area. Yeah. For the 100 plus samples, every one of them has cesium-134 and 137. Right. Some low, some not so low. But we had cobalt too, and this has got cobalt in it. Yeah, uh, cobalt-60, yeah. another yeah. common yeah. thing that we see. When we did the air filters, from the, the car engines. Uh, a few things that were interesting about it. A lot of these are from commercial or fleet vehicles. So we actually have a log about where they were driven, when they were used. The car filters, the way people drive in Japan, the number of miles that people do, the, the size of, uh, of these vehicles. Stoichiometrically, uh, a car engine filter promise, uh, processes about as much air in a day as a hard-working adult would process. So 10 to 30 cubic meters of air a day for a filter or for a person. So it's a nice qualitative model. So what you're seeing in some of these filters is what you would expect to see for a person exposed to the same air. So the idea of using the car filters was to take a large number of car filters and try and get a feel for whether or not we were getting radioactively hot particles outside the evacuation zone. And this is a, uh, one of about four different methods we've used for looking at air and dust in Japan and the U.S. and Canada. And this method was meant to give us that, that kind of like bird's eye view about what's happening. And what you immediately see when you look at this is Fukushima City, Tokyo, Seattle. I like this graphic because it's a, it's a fast, easy way to show, look, Fukushima City, even though you're 65 kilometers away, we pick up an enormous number of hot particles in these engine air filters. In Tokyo, we're still getting those hot particles. We're not at the levels where people are evacuating, but we're at the levels where people not need to think about how they're going to reduce dust exposure overall. That's just a good public health practice. And then in Seattle, I call this my stop whining graphic because really there's, there's not much happening in Seattle. West Coast of the United States, lower the stress level. We're fortunately not seeing it there. If anybody is going to see uh, radioactive transport outside of Japan, I would think at this point we're going to see it in the, in the marine environment, not in the air. We're going to see a lot more of it coming uh, through the ocean, maybe through uh, food coming from the ocean, then we're going to see it in these airborne plumes. And this sample for Seattle was collected during the time of maximum exposure, which was mid-April. That's when we had the highest rise, almost a doubling of uh, background levels that lasted for uh, about two weeks in the middle of April. The human lung is very good at picking up certain size dust particles. The, the range of dust particles that the lung is good at retaining is from about uh, 0.5 to 5 microns. And if you're not familiar with that unit, it's really a millionth of a meter or a thousandth of a millimeter. These are microscopic sizes. Things that are bigger never make it down into the deep lung. Things that are smaller tend to come in and then they get exhaled out again without sticking. So the particles that are in that size range are the important ones. And that's what my research project is about. How many of the dust particles are in the size range that's actually important for human lung exposure? If they're too big or too small, they're less of a problem for human health. But I need to know not the type of radiation so much, but I need to know how big the dust particles are that carry it and what they're made out of. When you know how big the dust particle is and what it's made out of, you can learn a lot about where it's going to end up in the environment. 
and how people will be exposed. So all that stuff about, you know, you're exposed to radiation in, in an airplane from cosmic rays or from eating bananas or whatever, it's just nonsense when you're thinking about trying to measure radiation exposure that's important for human health. That's a completely different ballgame. And that's what the dust research is all about. Right. So what we'll do is, we have our filter that's placed up on this x-ray plate. So because we can see the dark spotting from the radioactive particle, we can actually cut this piece out of the filter. And it goes on a little piece of, well, it's essentially expensive double stick tape. And it's this high carbon double stick tape that we use that goes straight into the scanning electron microscope. And you can actually look at the microscopic particle. You can take its picture and we hit it with an x-ray beam and that will tell us the composition of that particle. So if there is uranium in it, or if there is americium, or cesium, we'll see that. Now, I can't tell the difference between radioactive cesium and non-radioactive cesium, but there is no non-radioactive form of americium, for example. So those compounds, we can be certain. Kids were tracking in radioactive material on their shoes from being in contact with the upper soil. And this is also being done with gamma spectrometry. The nice thing about children's shoes is Children obviously get outdoors and they play in the dirt more than adults. Uh, children's shoes are small and they fit in my detector better. So we get better results working with kids' shoes. Gives us an idea of what we're looking at. We have never detected radioactive material from Fukushima in children's shoes in the United States. None of the samples are positive. <coughs> All of our shoes from Japan show that there's cesium-134 and cesium-137. So this is total both of them? That's the two combined, yeah. that's right. When I was in that park in Tokyo, when I took the sample by the tree, uh, that was decontaminated, and still we had you know, you know, high cesium and, and uh, both ceasings. And kids were running by throwing stones at each other, just like kids always do. Yeah. So I'm thinking, you know, they grabbed the stone on the ground, they threw it, and here I am measuring the ground. And it, you know, so if it's on their shoes, it's on their hands. Let's say it. If it's on their shoes. Well, it was on the shoelaces, for instance. We found that the radiation was also on the shoelaces. And when we do this x-ray autoradiograph, where we actually take the shoe and we put it on a piece of x-ray film, you can see the spotting from the radioactive particles stuck to the soles of the shoes. One of the things you get from looking at the, the individual particles, the individual hot radioactive particles, is you can tell the difference between radioactivity that comes from a natural source or from an industrial source. You can tell the difference between a particle that comes from Chernobyl or one that comes from Fukushima. They look different, they have different uh, chemical compositions. In the example of Fukushima and Chernobyl, Chernobyl particles have cesium-137. Fukushima particles have cesium-137 and cesium-134. So it's a signature, it's a fingerprint for the radiation coming out of Fukushima. So if you find a particle that has about the same amount of cesium-134 and 137, and it's less than, say, 20 microns or so, you found it on the west coast of the United States, that's telling you that you found a particle of radioactivity from Fukushima. But if there's no 134, it's from bomb testing or from Chernobyl. Could be bomb testing, could be Chernobyl, could be old radioactive waste, could be from a, a research reactor, but it wouldn't be from Fukushima. So one of the things that we will be able to do is, is tell you whether the radioactivity we're detecting is natural or not. And we get that all the time with folks who uh, used a Geiger counter to test something in their backyard or, or something that rained out. Uh, now the people are a little bit more aware of radiation in the environment. And the nice thing is people say, well, <clears throat> while it's radioactive, it has nothing to do with Fukushima. I have a question. Last night we were at a panel discussion um, in Massachusetts, and one of the panelists, who's a, a nuclear engineer for the industry, said that uh, it's all radiation. Radiation is natural. It's background. There's nothing to be worried about. We don't have to worry about any radiation. You know, things that are coming off of Pilgrim as a, as a nuclear plant don't matter because radiation is, is ubiquitous and it's part of our natural background. Can you differentiate that for the viewers? Sure. I mean, I, I think that's an interesting attitude because we'll go back to the radon issue. We've got uh, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has made a major push to try and get people to test for and, where necessary, reduce their exposure to radon because it's a significant health hazard. It is part of the radiation background. Background is not the same thing as safe. 
it's a, it's a public health problem that, that has been accepted. There is a, a government protocol for doing your testing. And there's some simple remedial steps that you can take and they don't break the bank. So I don't know why one agency of the government would say, you know, the agency that's, that's most concerned with environmental health, why are they saying this is a serious health problem that we need to work on? And someone else says, well, it's background, it's okay. Background is not okay. I mean, we all have natural ailments, things that harm our bodies. I don't care if they're natural. We'd rather stay healthy. So I, I, I'm, I'm a little confused about that one. The one that gets me, and it came up in the meeting last night, was the, uh, the radioactive banana. And, and, you know, we all have potassium. And our body's in equilibrium with that, with that potassium. Some of it's radioactive, some of it's not radioactive. So if you take potassium in, you're going to excrete potassium out because you're already in equilibrium with that potassium. And I can't understand how we can compare the dose of a banana to, you know, flying on a plane or working at Fukushima. Well, what it comes down to is radiation comes in different flavors. And some radiation does less damage than others. We have what's called a quality factor for radiation, where we say flat out, the amount of health damage that you do is related to the form of the radiation. So that this type of radiation might be 20 times more hazardous than that type of radiation. And that's something that's happening with a banana. All radiation isn't alike. And to imply that it is, is probably oversimplifying. Oversimplifying to the point where people fail to take steps that they could to improve their health. So, that, but the quality factor issue, I understand, you know, an alpha is worse than, if it's internal, an internal alpha is worse than an external alpha, neutrons are worse of all, and things like that. But, um, but that's for um, a ray or a burst of energy, most of that research. But, but the hot particle issue, where, where you're in, imbibing it, it's either, you know, coming in through your mouth or coming in through your lung, that quality factor it has got to be greater than an external exposure from, uh, from a, a gamma ray, for instance. You know, the best um, argument that I hear from folks when they talk about the difference between rays and hot particles goes something like this. It's complicated. And that's exactly right. It's very hard to measure exactly what the health damage will be from a hot particle compared to uh, a ray, an uh, energy ray, like a photon from a gamma ray or an X-ray. It's not saying that the hot particle is worse or better, but remember that the hot particle can be trapped in your body for a long time. The ray passes through you at light speed. It comes, it does its damage, it's gone. The hot particle, on the other hand, can stay in your body and continuously expose different cells in your body to radiation. So there's a, there's a qualitative difference in what happens because of the hot particle. Some researchers have said hot particles are actually better for you. Here's the reason. If you have a hot particle inside your body, there are parts of your body that are not exposed to that hot particle. That hot particle that's in your lung is not exposing your foot because it's shielded by the distance and by the intervening tissues, which I think is a terrible use of tissue, by the way, to use it as a radiation shield. But nevertheless, I understand. What they mean is it depends on where in your body that hot particle winds up. Does it dissolve in your body once you inhale it and then pass into the bloodstream to other parts of your tissues? Or does it say stuck in the lung? where it might cause, uh, well, in the case of plutonium oxide, a hot plutonium oxide particle would cause a, a fibrotic nodule in the lung. And it would actually damage some of the surrounding lung tissue. And then some of that tissue might even be uh, killed. Those cells will actually die. But the surviving cells potentially are, are tumorigenic sites, cancer-causing sites. These are all complicated processes that don't happen with rays. Now you had a picture of the plutonium oxide particle on the right? Yeah. Um, let's take a look. I can I can find it on my. Oh, it was still up there. We were looking at it before. So this is from an older health journal, and what you see here is, I'm just going to get it. This um, this particle is about a hundred micron size plutonium oxide particle, and you can see that there's a fibrotic nodule. If you're if you're a pathologist or histologist. Uh, in the healthy animal lung tissue that's actually closest to the particle. So it's done some physical damage to the cells that are closest to it where they're being directly exposed to alpha radiation. So this white stuff is what a, a normal lung would look like. So we've got the normal healthy cells, the particles and then we've got the fibrotic nodule that's formed because of the hot particle here. 
And again, that's about 100 microns across, maybe a little bit more. This is a half a millimeter, 500 microns. You get a feel for that. Most of the hot particles we've been looking at are a lot smaller than that. For them to travel a significant distance, they really have to be more on the order of 10 microns, not 100. Uh, at that size, they can go um, global distances. Just so what we saw atmosphere. in Seattle in April was this really small couple micron kind of particles. Yeah, yeah, we're seeing very small particles that are coming here to the U.S. As opposed to larger particles that would be deposited immediately around the plant. It's probably why they saw so much plutonium right around the plant, because a lot of those big particles dropped out closer. Yeah. They, they picked it up as far as 50 kilometers away, so this is yeah. the, the, the lot of, it must have been a lot in really close. And while I haven't seen the data, I would just assume that on average, the particles that are found further away tend to be smaller than the ones that are found close. Right, I got it. 